record. Okay. Um, great. Well, thank you all for, for joining here for your second presentation to hear a little bit about some of the bird-friendly forestry that, that has been going on with, with Audubon Vermont and uh, Cold Hollow to Canada Regional Partnership. Um, I want to start off by just kind of recapping recapping my, my one-minute teaser introduction here about how important the Northeast forest is to birds through our map that we see. This is um, on the upper left results of the North American Breeding Bird Survey, which specifically looks at forest nesting birds. And you can see the dark red color, which encompasses most of the region that we're being represented today is where we have some of the highest number of different species of nesting birds anywhere else in the country. So it really paints the, the picture of the importance of our Northeast forest to bird conservation. Below that, we can see uh, some, some evidence of the fact that private landowners really Really do care. One of their motivating factors is wildlife, um, and and this comes from the um, some research that's been done, kind of tracking that exact question: of why why do people own their forests? And wildlife being one of the top reasons throughout here of the Northeast. And then on the right, just a graphic to, to reinforce the fact that we do have um, quite a loss of some of our birds, the wood thrush here being one that's being represented, um, but a 17% loss in Eastern forest birds since 1970. So we've got a lot of birds, some of them are in decline. Thankfully, we have a landowner base that's interested in doing things to support them. So that's what we're gonna be sharing, Nancy and I will be sharing about. We do that, um, try to achieve that goal by mobilizing a network of landowners, land managers, and other resource professionals to, and their partners, to promote healthy forests for the benefit of birds and people. So we're kind of coming together to, it's, it's not just about the birds, but it's about the birds and the forests that they need, because we all know that those forests provide us with other, other really important aspects um, to our own lives um, beyond the bird habitat features. Audubon's been doing this work and engaging landowners and thinking about birds for quite a while, um, going on almost 20 years now. We do that through a number of ways. We work directly with private landowners to provide technical assistance. We work with, with professionals and doing workshops and trainings around the topic. And we also work with professionals to actually help do implementation of practices on the ground that can be used to, among other things, enhance habitat for birds. As we think about the RCP network and specifically the Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initiative work that we've been doing, this really started back in 2021 um, with some funding that we were uh, graciously able to receive through the, through the initiative to put together a four-part webinar series that was really designed through the RCP network. Perhaps some of you attended one or more of them. Uh, Nancy joined me as a presenter on, on one of them, but the, the main idea was to really get people thinking about how can we use birds as a way to engage people in their land and thinking about good stewardship that enhances bird habitat, but overall really is aimed at achieving a healthy forest for all those other ecosystem services that they that they uh, give us. Very successful between the number of people who attended those live webinars and those who have gone back since and viewed them as recordings, there have been over 700 views. I, I put 700, 700 people, I can't say that they're all individuals, but it could be same people that viewed them numerous times. But anyway, that's that's a lot of views of people who are interested in this topic and are going to, to learn more about how they can engage people in their network to, to achieve those goals. I'm going to turn it over to Nancy now, though. We're going to dive into the specifics of working with the RCP network, and she's going to kind of bring us up to speed on how uh, Cold Holiday Canada has engaged in this effort. Nancy? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, as you all know, Vermont's a, a relatively small state, so we, I've, I've been working with Steve uh, through the department uh, in Audubon for about 15 years, and you and I co-founded Cold Holiday Canada about 14 years ago. Uh, so really since that time, uh, we've been working together. And as you can see, the Cold Hall to Canada partnership is identified by the colored overlay, and it overlays directly on top of the most important priority bird habitat as identified by Audubon in the state of Vermont as well. So we were just always have been a good mix. We start, we've been working together a long time, so it was just natural for us to come together with Cold Hall to Canada to do work on the ground. Next slide, Steve. Cold Hollow to Canada is, is a small regional conservation partnership, but we're, we're located within uh, the, one of the priority zones that was identified by Two Countries, One Forest uh, to protect the integrity of the northern forest, which is the most intact broadleaf temperate forest in the, in the world. So we have a globally significant forest and we're working with globally uh, significantly concerned bird birds that, are, that need help to sustain. 
Uh, we do this uh, through, uh, we, Whole Health of the Canada has a lot of different programs. Our main goal is to, con is working with concert, is to conserve land permanently in this region. Our goal is to conserve 23,000 acres by 2030. Um, we have many programs, but this is one of our, our primary programs working with, through a program called the Woodlots Group. Go on to the next slide, Steve. I'm kind of rushing because we ran out of time the last time and I'm trying to push this through. But uh, so Cult Hall of the Canada does have a, a number of different programs. And one of those programs is the Woodlots program. And it's really considered our signature program. Uh, this is where we bring landowners together within smaller groups. And we do this by town. Uh, on the right, you'll see that uh, Steve has shown the town of Richford and the town of Montgomery and the parcels that are our members of these of this Woodlots program have been identified. So what we do in the Woodlots program is bring people together to learn from each other in a peer-to-peer -peer network. And two of the primary um, startups that we do with each program is we do a climate change uh, assessment of their forest management plans, and we offer them a, um, a songbird habitat assessment uh, on their on each and individual property. Uh, as well as in the end, taking all of those individual assessments and bringing them together into a landscape uh, report. Uh, to date, we have uh, five different Woodlot programs, uh, and th there are four that have had com have assessments completed. So we've uh, uh, we've provided Audubon Vermont has provided assessments on forty seven individual properties. Um, with, through these four different woodlot programs, and that covers about 9,000 acres. Uh, we have another woodlots program that has just started, and this spring and summer, Audubon, Vermont, will be coming out to do assessments on 14 more landowner properties. Uh, and this, what this provides landowners is, is information for their um, management that they, they find out from each other on this landscape level where things are needed, where things can be helped, and it empowers people to work together at a landscape level. Uh, one of the things that uh, we can do is, is start the implementation work. So the, the empowerment comes from working together and actually seeing something on the ground, going to a neighbor's property and seeing how that's done and moving forward. This, this program has really been instrumental in active forest management in, in our region. Steve, anything would you like to add to this? Yeah, no, it's great. I, I think just highlighting again that kind of that landscape approach to thinking about all of this. Um, so just to, to kind of go a little deeper onto this chart that's here, um, the blacked outside, each of those would be a different landowner name as you go down that particular column, but we just blocked that out for, for privacy purposes. But as you go across there, basically what it shows is for each landowner that we, in the town of Montgomery that this is representing, um, their property offered for the first row as an example, 221 acres of mature forest, three acres of young forest, two acres of wetland and no open land. And we did that for every property that was part of that, that, that Woodlots group. Because in the end, you know, there are opportunities sometimes where at a landscape level, we might deem it valuable to create some more young forest habitat um, on a particular part of that, that landscape. But not all landowners may be interested in that. So just seeing kind of what is, how does it flesh out? How many um, acres are there of different habitat conditions within a landscape and where then can we find opportunities to create the nice mix that we often shoot for. And that's that's something that my work at Audubon over the years, Cold Hollow to Canada is the only place where I've been able to do something of this nature, which is very, very powerful and impactful. And, and the Cold Hollow to Canada partnership um, really is, is getting us to a different scale of impact than we have had um, through some of our other work. And I'll, I'll talk more about that towards the end. But I want to I want to now dive in a little bit deeper to um, a, kind of the implementation phase of some of this. So what we just talked about, what Nancy's been talking about in the habitat assessments, is really designed to give landowners information to help inform the management. Having a management plan that, that incorporates language to be managing the forest with birds in mind is absolutely necessary, but it really needs to then translate to work being done on the ground. And so the implementation phase, I want to, to, to give us an example here, um, brings in another program at Audubon that, that we have going on, which is our bird-friendly maple program. So folks may know Vermont 
does lead the country when it comes to the amount of maple syrup produced every year. We produce about 50% of the U.S. crop. Um, so we have a lot of sugar bushes or forests that are managed for, for sap production out there. And we're, we're working with the maple industry to help them be partners in bird conservation so that when they're thinking about managing their sugar bush, how can they do that with an eye for bird habitat as well as sap production? In this particular one, Bardwoods Maple um, is the producer in Belvedere, Vermont. It's a 270 acre sugar bush. Um, and it was really time before they went in and installed a, a pipeline or tubing framework for collecting sap in a new area of their woods. It was time to go in there and do a little bit of forest management to not only um, make those trees more healthy for sap production, but also to enhance the habitat quality, uh, make it more structurally complex so that certain birds would be able to find the habitat that they need. A lot of times you can find in, in forest work, as folks may know, you know, you can generate revenue from the sale of, of forest products. Um, but sometimes it's difficult to do that, and we'll, we'll get to, to why that is important here in just a little bit. But in this particular case, we brought in a, a third partner to the mix. It's the VYCC, or the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. This is kind of an unconventional partner for us um, up until about two years ago. It's a youth training uh, program throughout the state of Vermont, mostly known for their work with uh, trail building, trail maintenance. But two years ago, they did start a forestry program to give opportunities and experience for young youth and young adults to get involved in, in forestry related activities, including um, forest operations and, and felling trees and, and things like that. This was a great opportunity working at Bardwoods Maple to bring the VYCC crew in, again, through some, some funding assistance through the Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initiative to get that work done. So here we are kind of pre-harvest getting going out there and, and, and talking about some of the things that would be happening. The trees were all marked with paint by the consulting forester for the property ahead of time. Um, but having the crew understand what they were doing, why they were doing it, what the benefits would be, was something we really wanted to make sure would happen. The work that they did covered uh, a span of two weeks. They, they treated about eight acres total um, of that 270 acres of sugar bush, but it was a start and it really provided not only enhancement to habitat, but great opportunity for these, these young people to, to learn more about this profession. The work that they did though really was instrumental for over time as the forest responds to that treatment, enhancing habitat for birds like these, the black-throated blue warbler, which will do well in nesting in some of the young growth, the regeneration that happens um, through opening up small gaps in the canopy, the wood thrush, which will be um, better able to, to find nesting structure within the mid canopy layer of the forest. And then by making sure that there's a diversity of trees beyond sugar maple in this in the sugar bush, helping birds like scarlet, scarlet tanager, which, which often prefer to, to forage on tree species like yellow birch and others besides sugar maple. Um, so this was something that we wanted to make sure that, that those, those young people knew about and that they knew that their efforts were gonna be helping to establish those kinds of conditions. This is an important quote re relating back to the point about how you know you can generate revenue often off of, of uh, timber harvest and, and forest products, but in this particular case, it may have been difficult. So this is Matt Paggy, Paggy, I get that right, Nancy, yeah, Paggy, uh, of who is from Bardswoods, Bardwoods Maple. Um, without the VYCC, this job likely wouldn't have been done. So that that habitat enhancement work probably wouldn't have been done. The wood that was harvested was very low value, was non-commercial in nature. And so it was often, it can be difficult to attract logging contractors to wanna to do jobs of that type. They have to truck their equipment on site and spend time harvesting wood that really is of low economic value. So in this particular case, providing, um, having the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps available to do that work was really deemed as the only way that it probably could have been done, at least in the time frame that we were looking to get it, uh, to make it happen. And that, that scene um, does tend to be playing out more and more um, throughout the state. So a couple of key takeaways from, from the work with Cold Holiday Canada that, that really have been kind of standing out to me over the years. Um, one is to, is to make sure you have a very powerful and impactful uh, conservation story to go along with it. So those of us in conservation, you know, we know all, all of our work is important, but um, being able to tell the story that, as Nancy likes to say and has said it, Cold Holiday Canada is part of the largest temperate largest intact temperate forest in the world. That's a pretty big statement. We also know from our map that, that we have some of the highest richness of bird species. Those are powerful things to tell in stories and to, to get people excited um, about taking positive actions to affect them. So what's your, what's your story in the region that you work in? What are the ways that you can best engage people in something that will get them excited? Um, another outcome of this and success really is understanding that there's the partnership with existing networks is really key. Um, as I mentioned at Audubon, we've been doing a lot of landowner outreach and technical assistance offering for many years. 
but it's often piecemeal, landowner in this town, landowner in this town, landowner in southern Vermont, landowner in northern Vermont. And by working with an, the Cold Hollow to Canada Regional Partnership, that network really helped us to connect with a collective of landowners all in one area. Um, and the impact of that is much greater than having a scattershot of different landowners around the state. So the impact, the scale of that impact becomes much more. Incentivizing conservation behaviors. Um, Landowners will often say that, that making money off of timber harvest is not one of their primary objectives, but having something that makes you, incentivizes you to take those actions other than just relying on people's goodwill to want to do so can be very beneficial. So whether that just be signage, um, all of these woodlots owners do get a sign, you know, that kind of shows that they're part of something larger. Um, I don't know how much that incentivizes people, but I suspect for some it's an important thing to have. Our bird friendly maple program allows maple producers that are part that are working with us to label their maple products as coming off of forests that are managed with birds in mind. That helps them stand out in a retail marketplace, which in Vermont for maple is pretty crowded. So, so it's, there's a benefit to them um, engaging with us. And finally, creative partnerships. Um, I mentioned the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps is kind of a non-conventional partner. Um, we haven't really thought about those kinds of groups in the past, and yet this was a great opportunity. It made a lot of sense to, to work with them um, and, and come together to actually get work done on the ground. So we'll stop there. We've got about two, two and a half minutes left. Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that we can all see each other. And if folks have questions, um, go ahead and either just raise your chat hand or your uh, Zoom hand or put it down in the chat there. All right, Laura, go ahead. So um, I was really interested to see that the Youth Conservation Corps helped you. Um, were, I, I saw someone walking around with a chainsaw. With the, were they cutting the trees just with chainsaws? And then my other question is, were they leaving them there or taking them out? Great questions. So and I'll let, let Nancy can chime in too. But yes, they were the ones who were, they had gone through training the game of logging, a uh, very well known program for teaching safe chainsaw operation and tree felling. Uh, so they did all that. All that wood then was left on the ground. Um, so it was it adding coarse and fine woody material in the forest floor, um, but that was the, the particular. And um, in the areas where they were taking the tree out, trees out, do you know if it was like 10% canopy cover or kind of yeah, so, ballpark? So so the treatment was a, was called a crop tree release with canopy gap formation. So that's technical jargon. Essentially, they were pretty small, pretty lightweight harvesting. So that any gap creation they did was in the in the neighborhood of you know half a tree length in width or less. So maybe thirty feet, forty feet in width. Um, so pretty small, natural kind of natural disturbance sized mm -hmm. gaps. I'm particularly interested in this. For not only because of the low value timber that we have in a lot of our forests here that would need to come out, but also because people generally here in Metro West Boston don't like tree cutting so much. And it's, you know, with the big machinery and it's loud and it's intrusive. So um, I was really interested to see this example. I think it could potentially work really well for us. Yeah, um, could I say that we have uh, the, <clears throat> we, we use, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> now I can't talk. Um, invasive plants was something that was just brought up in the chat. And we do have a problem, but in this particular area, that particular property had no invasive plants. And we're very lucky in some of the northern greens. Mm -hmm. um, we only have a couple of seconds left. I, I have to say that the implementation of the practices that we do um, really follow the silvicultural guidelines that were set out with the, the partnership between forest, the Forest Bird Initiative and, and uh, uh, the Department of Forest Parks and Rec. And so we do, there is documentation of that on both our websites that you can follow up with as well. And practices are also implemented based on the assessments with other funding that we have. So there are many, many practices um, implemented on these properties that were directly associated with the habitat assessments that were done by Audubon Vermont. So this was a clear linkage between uh, interest of landowners, forest bird habitat improvement, and peer-to-peer um, -peer network training. So it, it was a, a really beautiful place to bring that story, as Steve said, uh, within our largest intact um, broadleaf temperate forest in the world. 
Um, feel free to reach out to answer I with questions.